So as, uh, as was mentioned, uh, today's uh, presentation is on uh, doing a thermal study within Astra and NCAT. And uh, I don't want to PowerPoint everyone to death, so I just have a couple of quick slides I want to go through and then I'll uh, get right to it. Um, so first things first, what is NASTRA and NCAD, right? It's a general purpose FEA tool. Uh, it's embedded right inside of your CAD system. So um, instead of having to learn a new interface, new keyboard controls for navigating inside of that environment, it's, it's right available to you. Uh, right within that space. Uh, it's also very easy to get access to. You just jump into environments and you click a quick button and it just starts firing up. Um, it's very flexible. Uh, it's powered by the uh, the NASTRAN solving space, um, which is an industry known uh, solver, uh, obviously developed by NASA. Um, so a lot of capabilities uh, within that space. Um, and uh, there are some different uh, licensing function functionality available for it as far as setting it up on the network. Uh, for that sort of you know network licensing schema that you might have with your inventor, uh, a lot of different functionality within the NASTRAN NCAD space. Um, and on this first page here, I've just kind of boxed in what the standard functions within Inventor Professional are, and that's kind of the big comparison, right? We're doing the same type of simulation, or even more so, I should say, inside of Inventor Professional. So let's just kind of see what more we can do. So, you know, in Inventor Pro, we can do the basic linear uh, static analysis as well as just a uh, normal modes or uh, harmonic frequency uh, analysis on a design. Uh, taking that to uh, dramatically different levels uh, within Astro and NCAD, we can do uh, buckling analysis or, or critical failure on a, on a design. Uh, we can do pre-stress uh, and beyond that doing things like our thermal analysis, so whether that's a steady state heat transfer, uh, a thermal stress, uh, or doing m even more of that nonlinear uh, steady state uh, transient heat transfer type analysis, uh, we have that available. Um, you know, going beyond the modal analysis, uh, we can do frequency response or random response, and kind of the highest level of analysis inside of NASH and NCAD is doing uh, nonlinear analysis with unique material types or doing uh, physical contact or drop analysis inside of the space. So right out of the, the box there, a ton of different functionality that's available within that Astran NCAD space and it's embedded right inside of your inventor environment so you're not having to swap, uh, swap environments or swap software to, to get that analysis completed. Um, so what we're going to work on today or what we're going to be looking at um, we have some pipes that need supported, uh, and they've got some kind of hot fluid or hot object inside of them, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, the supporting methodology that we use is going to be able to support uh, not only the heat load, but also the weight of the pipes. Um, in our case, we're going to be looking at one analysis, and we want to take a look at a couple of different um, supporting methods or supporting bracket types, and just take a look to see or confirm um, that you know we are using the best supporting method within our design. Uh, so without too much further ado here, let's jump over to Inventor and start taking a look at this. So in this case, I'm going to open up my first assembly file and uh, nothing overly fancy in here, just a, a five-part assembly. Uh, to get access to the NASTRAN NCAD environment, we simply jump over to Environments and we choose our NASTRAN NCAD from the list. Um, so inside of this space, uh, first big thing about it that I really like, um, and I've learned a number of different uh, simulation tools, uh, ANSYS Workbench, um, Simulation Mechanical, um, even before Autodesk acquired it. And the biggest thing about it was the interfaces were very different than the CAD environment. Obviously, in this case, all it's doing is opening up another ribbon across the top. And our, our model browser that usually gives us data about the assembly is now giving us information about the analysis. Um, the other thing that I really like about the interface in here is it's relatively linear in function. So you know, the first thing that I would want to do is set up my analyses, define the properties about the physical data, as far as the physical properties of the data, um, then go in and set up my loads and constraints as well as my contacts given that this is an assembly file. If I have any final preparations for the meshing, I have the ability to do that followed by generating the mesh, 
running it, and then checking the results. And again, all I did there was run from left to right across the ribbon interface. And to me, that's really, really helpful, right? Being able to easily get access to this functionality, even if it is a very complex analysis type that we're going to be working on, it's very easy to get into that space. So, like I mentioned, the first thing I need to do here is set up my analysis. So right now it's a linear static. Obviously, I want to come in and uh, do my thermal study first. So we'll go ahead and edit this, and I'll just give this a new name. I promise not to type too much while I'm doing this analysis. Um, in this case, we'll just put in here a little bit of a note about what we're doing here. Change the type to our linear steady state heat transfer. Um, I will grab that again just to kind of show here. It's kind of broken down into the different types of uh, analyses that we might run, right? Physical deformation, vibrational studies, uh, fatigue analysis, and then finally the heat transfer. Um, lastly, inside of this dialog box, as far as information that I would want to specify, the units of this is really important. Um, obviously, in this case, I'm just going to use the uh, imperial standard. Um, but I do also have in here, um, obviously, the, the different types of units that would potentially be available to me within that space. And these will come into play later on when we start looking at things like our properties and our, our loading and constraining. So we want to make sure that we have the correct units across these designs. In my case, I am going to make sure that heat flux is outputted so that I can see that heat flux on this design. Uh, really not a whole lot of other options in here that I do want to deal with, but there are some things about uh, dealing with the options of it, so what's the default contact sets, and if I did have a very complex design, one of the things that I could do is go in and set, set up alternate levels of detail, and in this case I created this kind of as a show, but I could build like a simulation if I wasn't concerned about like the fasteners or some complexity of the design that wasn't part of the actual analysis. Right? All I have to do is create a level of detail and suppress those components out, then I'm not meshing them, including them in the simulation, and so on. So I can take them out in the assembly side and then move forward at this point. All right, so I've got my analysis type defined. The next thing I want to take a look at is the physical properties of this design, and NASTRAN automatically pulls in the physical properties of the components that were defined within the auto or the inventor space. So I've got some generic material and some steel mild components. And what I want to do here is the first thing is I'll check the steel mild properties to make sure that the values that I'm looking for are in place. Um, out of the box, this probably won't have your thermal values defined. Um, so in my case, I've already kind of punched this stuff in. I've also specified what my reference temperature is for this component. And one of the nice things about these interfaces, if you don't understand what these values are, if you put your cursor on it, it'll highlight and it at least give you an understanding of not only what the value is, but also what the current dis the current uh, input values are. So, you know, in this case, reference temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Um, from here, I'm going to go and hit OK. And what I want to do is I want to create a new material to replace this, you know, relatively bad generic material. So I'll just go to New. <coughs> and in this case, I don't want to have to hand enter all these values in, um, so I'm just going to go to Select Material, and we'll see in here we have our stock Inventor and Autodesk material libraries that we're familiar with from Inventor. Uh, but in this case, I want to grab one from Nastran. So I'll go ahead and hit Load Database, and in here I'll see I've got this material, Nastran material library. And inside of this, there are hundreds and hundreds of materials based on real data. So steels, titaniums, other materials, in this case even some um, non-metal materials inside of this space. In this case, I want 1070 hot rolled. So go ahead and choose that. When I load this, it fills in most of the values. I need to specify my general, uh, my, my reference temperature, my stock uh, temperature in here. So go ahead and specify that as 70. So now that I have the material loaded, I need to make sure that the physical properties are using that material. So I'll edit my physical property, and I'll specify that I do want to use this 1070. Um, I don't like using gray colors on these. When we generate the mesh, the mesh itself will be colored based on this color. So I'm going to give this a little bit better. 
colorization so it's a little easier to understand. And we can see here right now this one is associated to the shoe, which is what we're after. So I'll go ahead and accept that. Uh, additionally, I'm going to edit this physical property and just make sure that all four of my other components are associated. See in here the selected elements or entries, so we can see there inside of that space. Perfect. Okay, so physical properties are done. The next thing I need to do in here is, because I'm working in an assembly space, I want to make sure that all of my contact is defined. And I could go through and pick all the faces and specify that they're all bonded, but they're adjacent to one another in the in the model, right? I use good constraints to lock all this stuff together. So instead of having to make all of them, I'm going to just tell the system, go ahead and figure out some of the constraints or contacts on its own. So in here we can see it's created four different surface contacts, um, and it shows you the two elements that are associated to one another, and as I, I click on them, it'll give me a nice preview, saying, okay, these two faces are adjacent, so we'll go ahead and build that contact at that location. Uh, the ones that didn't get created, right, we've got the bolt to the threaded head and the other bolt to the threaded head, or nut, excuse me, not bolt. Um, we didn't get the inside of the engagement here. And this is one of those common sort of behaviors, right? I've got a threaded component and I've got a hole. They probably are the same size or adjacent to one another, and I want to make sure that I'm getting a contact between those two objects, but I don't model threads, so I'm not getting that engagement exactly the way that I would expect. In all reality, I could probably go modify this component um, to change that object. And note that at any time in this process, I could finish the NASTRAN, jump back over to my model, edit this component, jump right back in here again without having to re-export, re-import, do any of that sort of weird swapping software, handshaking type steps, right? I'm in Inventor. I don't need to worry about any of that. So in my case, I'm just going to create the contact assuming that they are actually touching. So we'll go ahead and do a manual contact, and we'll specify the type. Uh, there's five different types of contact. This is another one of those big differentiators between Inventor Professional and um, Nastran. Inventor really can't handle parts coming away from contact with one another. Uh, the system can, where it can uh, specify those, those gaps. So. In my case, I'm just going to tell it it's a bonded contact. I'll then specify the two faces that need to be uh, touching one another. So these two faces here and here. Um, at the bottom of the, the dialog box, we have the ability to create duplication um, or just start a new one from here. It's kind of like an apply button. So I'll go ahead and hit new. I'll specify the same settings a second time. Bonded from here to there. Okay. So I've got my two extra contacts inside of this space. Um, so I've defined essentially how this assembly functions. I've also defined the materials on it. So I need to start building up my uh, loading on this component. So the first thing I'll do is I'll create a new subcase. And we'll just call this subcase one in this case. Um, subcases are there to allow me to maybe change things like um, maybe I want to change the convection settings or I want to change the uh, overall thermal load on the component, I can generate multiple loading conditions and set up subcases that utilize all of those lo subcase or those those loading conditions in different combinations. So I could say, okay, well, let's apply a thermal load and uh, a second thermal load from somewhere else, for example. Or, you know, in this case, uh, because it's a thermal scenario, it's really not really not all that complex, right? It's just thermal loading and, and the convection, but if I were doing a force load example, you know, I could apply, you know, forces from different locations and then essentially take out of subcases some of those loading conditions. And so in this case, I just need a quick load. I'll go ahead and specify it. I've got a temperature and I'll specify my temperature in here and then the face that I want to associate it to. Additionally, I have another uh, not constraint. I have another load that I want to make sure to pull it through. In this case, convection. I'll specify my ambient temperature and my thermal coefficient. Zero two two six one two. Uh, in this case, I need to specify which faces are going to convect the heat. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to come into my select entities, and instead of trying to just manually pick, I'm going to kind of turn on a filter 
to select faces and new in NASTRAN uh, 2016 I can window select the entire set. Now in this case in order to stop it from having any weird behavior I am going to remove this face from the selection set um, and now we have all of our faces selected. When I do this it's going to apply that convection load to uh, each of those faces and we'll see it on screen with uh, the display tech tick mark and what I can do in this case I'm just going to go ahead and turn that load off so it's not so busy. Um, real easy to do that I can either right click on each individual load and turn off their display or I can just tell it to hide them all and they're gone. So again I'm just kind of working my way across the top here I've defined the physical properties in the analysis I want to run I've got my loading and conditions set up I've got my contacts defined because I'm in an assembly space I don't need to worry about any of this I've been dealing with you know relatively solid objects so I'm just going to jump into my meshing um, it won't let me it won't let me run this analysis at this point right because I don't have a mesh and it's kind of letting me know right there's no there's no mesh it needs to be updated I go ahead and edit this and I can change some of the settings for it and you know one of the things that it's always kind of that 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 process that we have to teach when we when we teach these classes is the art of meshing right and in this case I'm not going to go through a lot of specific controls about editing these components and setting up each component to have its own mesh settings um, but you know the big thing to remember is we need to create kind of that harmony between having enough information or enough mesh elements to process properly but not so many that it takes hours and hours and hours to process this data and if I were to run this right now using these settings and I, I don't want continuous meshing this is a tool for when you're dealing with large assembly files that have lots of face-to-face -face contact um, I don't need that in this case so I'm not going to worry about that the bigger time the bigger uh, scenario where you'd want that is if you have large rectangular faces um, continuous meshing will make sure that the nodes the the mesh ends uh, come in contact in several locations to confirm or guarantee better uh, contact on those faces. I don't need that in this case. I'm dealing with small elements in their round. So if I generate this mesh with these large element sizes, um, we're going to see in here that it's going to create a very, very coarse mesh. And there's a couple of problems with it. Um, first and foremost, if I zoom in, we can see in here it's creating a lot of really odd shapes to try to create that donut profile and you want to try to get your mesh elements to all be relatively uniform in shape so in order to fix this I'm just gonna dial that size down and I'm gonna dial it down to what I'm actually after and we'll see in here you know this uniformity right where we're seeing these really long and thin faces that's gonna go away right because the overall element size is so much smaller when I regenerate this does take a little bit longer to generate the mesh because there's so many of them but now instead of getting really long thin elements we're getting a lot of uh, essentially a lot of shape that are uniform in in in, defi in in definition now obviously in this case we've got some you know real small elements that are getting pinched in so we have to have a little bit of that sacrifice but if I were to try to make all of the elements that small so that it was you know really really nice and all uniform you know I'd end up with instead of having a total element count of you know 40,000 I'd be in the millions and then it would just take forever to try to process all of that so again that fine tuning of the balance is really key inside of this space if you have a lot of very small curvature in your design um, one of the things that I would recommend is is it actually necessary right if it if you can blend those corners back to being sharp you can definitely take out a lot of that that resource to try to process those faces um, you know in this case it's probably one of those things that I should probably do um, you know if I spin this model a little bit here we'll see we've got this blended curve you can actually see the the elements are are deviating right it's essentially like a chord inside a curve so you know if I took that curve out is it really going to affect what I'm trying to accomplish in this case probably not same sort of thing with these bolts uh, or excuse me I said the bolts again uh, the same thing with these nuts right those little chamfered faces across the top right this came out of the content center it's got a little bit of extraneous faces that probably aren't going to affect my simulation at all so I might want to go through and, and rebuild a new nut to put in this model um, that's a little bit less 
uh, defined. In this case, it's really not that overly complicated. I'm dealing with five parts, right? So those questions, right, are these details all that necessary? It's really when you start to get this element count into the very, very high space. Or when you run your analysis, you end up with weird results, right? Those are the kind of the things that you're going to be watching for. Those are the questions you're going to want to start asking, right? Do I need to tweak my mesh? Should I take out some of the detail on my model? Um, do I need to remodel some components in order to make the simulation work better, work more accurately to the design where it might be causing problems by actually having the mesh uh, be too coarse or what have you. Okay, so enough, enough talking about the mesh here. Um, I've defined my uh, analysis type, I've defined my materials properly, I've got my loading in place as far as the temperature and the convection, I've also defined my mesh orientation and size correctly to give me relatively clean results on this model. So from here I'm ready to run it. If I had any problems, it would have notified me right there as soon as I hit the run button. If I had some kind of weird mesh convergence or if I had elements or data missing, it would have kicked an error to say, hey, You've done something wrong here. Right? In this case, this will take about a minute to run. Um, notice on the left-hand side, as this is running, uh, the NASTRAN output appears and starts to give me information about the design. Um, usually, you're going to get some warnings about your mesh that there might be weird spots in it, but as long as you don't get any fatal errors in here, you're usually pretty good to go. Um, from here, uh, we'll go ahead and orient our view here so we can see what we're doing. And we'll take a look at the heat flux on this design. So we can see that in this case, due to the shape of this shoe, right, we only have a very small tangent area that's in contact with the pipe, and because of that, we're not getting a lot of heat transfer through the design. Um, if I check my temperatures in here, uh, same sort of scenario comes through. Uh, we're only getting a small amount of uh, convection through that shape in this design. So with that in mind, I'm going to take this information and I'm going to transfer it into a stress analysis, a linear stress analysis, to see how this this heat inside of this design affects my uh, affects the uh, deflection or the displacement of this design. So, in order to do that, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate my thermal analysis, and I want to create a secondary, separate one. Before I do that, I should probably save just to make sure that everything is loaded or, or saved up. All right. So duplicate, it's going to take a moment, churn and process out a new copy of that analysis. Okay, so we can see in here our thermal copy. I'll go ahead and edit this analysis and change the settings for it. In this case, this is no longer a thermal. It's called st stress. update the title, and then change the type associated, in this case, linear static. Units are the same. Um, I, again, when you change your type, it will update the output controls as far as what information you're going to get defined. And in this case, when I hit OK, it's going to essentially harp at me and say, hey, you've got extra data in here that we don't need. We're going to take it out, right? So here in this case, we can see the analysis type is not valid. Um, Within NASTRAN, one of the nice things about it, right, up at the top I've got the two different analyses. I'm currently in the stress value. Uh, the thermal is still there. If I needed to reactivate, all I have to do is right click on it. But in addition to that, all of my other properties, loads, contacts, etc., are all loaded in the bottom portion in this model section. So if I wanted to <coughs> maybe swap out materials, I could swap those in and out from one, one analysis to another. So that's really helpful with that duplication. Right, I could duplicate the analysis, change the copied physical properties to be new materials, and check against the same loads. Or like in my case, I change the actual analysis type, still using the same physical data inside of the space. So in this case, I've got that thermal loading. I'm going to go ahead and remove that from the space, and I'm going to create a link to the output from the first analysis. To do that, I'll create a new load, give it a quick name, and define from output. From here, I'll just browse to that component data. In this case, I've got my shoe 
uh, analysis. So I'll go ahead and load that. And we can see in here which subcase and which data do I want to pull. So in this case, that thermal loading. I'll create another load to represent the pipe weight. Define it as a force. Which faces I want to associate it to. In this case, the face where the pipe is resting. In this case, it's a total force. 235 in the negative y direction. So if we look really closely in here, I'm sure we can find them. Let's see if I can track them down. Um, maybe go in here and edit this. And we'll increase the density and the size a little bit. There we go. So we can see the ends of the arrows. If I, if I kind of get right on top of it there, we can, there it is. So we can see there the force load downward on the part, right? I know it's kind of tough to see in this case because the, the glyph is buried in the model, um, but it is there. So the last thing I need to do is define the constraints that hold this in place. So I'll go ahead and add that constraint across the top. The two faces are fixed. It applies that symbology again. Uh, so in this case, we've got the loading from the thermal as well as the weight of the pipes. We've got the locking of the ends of the threaded rods. I'll regenerate the mesh. Every time you do a duplication, you have to regenerate. The value should stay the same, though, since I didn't change any physical prop physical model data. And now from here, I can run the second analysis on this component. So while this is running, and it's probably getting close, but there's one question in here asking about availability in plant 3D. Um, no. Uh, the the NASTRAN NCAD system uh, is embedded inside of Inventor. Um, so the, the basic process would be um, you can export that data out as a neutral formatted file, and then you'd be able to reload it inside of this space. Uh, you know, in my case here, I'm using very simplified models. Um, but that data would have to be generated inside of the inventor space. All right, so that's now finished. So now we'll take a look at our overall von Mises stress here. Darn it, why in the world? Let me check my pipe force here a second. Drop this down by a small amount. I had this happen earlier, and I'm not exactly sure why the simulation deforms the wrong way. Let me just update it. If it wants to be uh, stubborn, I'll switch over to my finished, my completed assembly file, which has the same data in it, but the simulation uh, created the correct output. There we go. Yeah. So for the reason that force was just uh, the, the calculation of the, the mesh was not correct. So just had to rerun it with uh, slightly tweaked values. If I went back and reset them, it would it would output the way that it's supposed to. So in this case, right, I can see in here the overall stress on this component um, in this case is uh, 3.704. Let's take a quick measure number here. 704 e to the fourth. And if I check my overall displacement in here, uh, we can see that overall displacement in this case is 0 0.00229 inches. So very, very minimal amount of uh, stress load on that component. Uh, if I do check my safety factor, we can see in here there's a, a, sm a very large space of uh, essentially exceeded value. So this could tell me that 
a couple of things might be happening, right? Maybe the thickness of this material is uh, is not correct, or I need to I need to look at getting a larger size version of it, um, or I might want to look at using some different fixturing methods. Right? So, in this case, I'm going to finish the Nastran in Incad environment and save this file. And then I'll jump into one of the other options. So in this case, I've got an alternate modeling type. In this case, quite a bit more data going in. But the thing to think about in here is this model is going to have a lot more surface contact with the pipes. And I believe in this case, due to that, we're going to end up with a lot more uh, thermal loading on this component. So one thing that I did mention earlier that I did do in this case, right, I do have other components inside of this design that I've taken out because they really don't contribute to the overall process of this model. Uh, as far as uh, the simulation is concerned, you know, there's a number of different ways that I can process those bolts inside of this space. Uh, I can generate representative bolts using a couple of different tools. And uh, let's just jump in there and take a look at this. And in my case, um, given how this model is functioning, uh, I didn't include them at all um, just to streamline the overall amount of time. Um, but we do have the ability to create those types of contacts um, inside of this space as well as generating um, specific constraint types within the space. Um, so inside this environment, I've created uh, both of those same exact uh, configurations. And let's go ahead and load the results for the ring file. And we can see in here the overall stress on this component and the concentrations of it near the upper side of this design, as well as the, ch the overall displacement being dramatically more about double. If I check my thermal loading in here, it takes a moment to load. Let me load those results. Nope, it's not showing me the heat flux. Let me rerun this. And in this case, we can see because of that overall contact with the pipe itself, we're getting a lot more of that thermal uh, exterior loading on this part and the heat flux to show that uh, transition through the design. Um, so again, you know, based on the overall contact of this, because of the overall amount of heat ex uh, uh, sent through uh, the pipe, we're getting a lot more of that distribution of that heat, uh, which in turn is going to contribute to the deformation. So lastly here, we'll take a look at our a little bit more of a bulkier design. In this case, instead of having contact all the way around the pipe, we're dealing with just one full surface. Uh, still more than our tangent location, uh, but still less than our, uh, or more than our ring location, but I'm being stupid here. More contact than the tangent option, but less than the ring option. Sorry, I goofed that up there. Um, and again, we'll jump back over into the Nastran environment. And instead of jumping through the thermal analysis, I'm just going to load the results for the deformation. And we'll take a look at those. So in this case, uh, 
the stress distri distribution of this due to the overall uh, size of this design, uh, a lot more of the types of results we might be looking for. Um, if I check the displacement of this, we can see the pipe is still going to sag. It's better than our other uh, resultant, uh, but if I check the safety factor in here, the only place of, of real uh, dis uh, only place of real discerning is uh, on this bolted location or the uh, the head of the uh, clevis design. So in this case, it might be an issue of okay, well let's think about maybe lessening the total number of brackets or, or increasing the number of brackets or decreasing the spacing between them to uh, lessen the overall weight load on this component. Right? Same scenario. All I would want to do in this case to check that analysis would be to copy the subcase. Excuse me copy the subcase or duplicate it, I could then create a second downward force that's less, uh, remove this downward force from the design, and then rerun the analysis to see the effects of maybe uh, you know, doubling up the total number of uh, clevises in the system. So in this case, I just kind of uh, broke down all of the, the different locations and the amount of displacement and pressure on the component. In this case, we have um, a lot of displacement in this ring style design, probably not going to be the type of uh, design that we'd want to use in this space. Um, with the shoe style, we have a lot uh, less thermal displacement across our components, um, but the displacement is, um, in, because of that, the displacement is less. Uh, with our, thir our, our second design, this clevis design, the stress is a lot more distributed throughout the component, um, and the uh, but because of it, we have some maximum stresses that are a little bit higher uh, at the mounting locations of our fasteners, for example. So some different analyses inside of, the, in, inside of these designs, and with that, we can kind of visualize and see where that thermal loading is going to go um, and how that's going to affect our, um, our components inside of a, a more real-world space. All right. So I guess we'll take a minute and see if there are any questions in the list here. Where is my Looks like we only had the one question. Um, hmm. Is there any other question that I can answer? Keith, I'll jump in here and um, let everyone know that if you guys do think of questions later, you can um, simply reply with your question to in that GoToMeeting uh, reminder email you received, and we can get those to Keith um, for any answers you may need um, or to the appropriate party to get your questions answered. Um, if there's nothing further, it doesn't look like I've seen any more pop-ups, so we will go ahead and close down our presentation. Uh, once again, if you could take a few moments to answer the short survey, we would appreciate it. It'll automatically pop up when you close down your session. And let's see. There Keith, there was location? one more. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing it there. It's, uh, is there a reference location for heat to stress load steps? Um, as far as being able to take the analysis data out of uh, one analysis and bring it into the next, um, the, um, the instructions for that, um, if I go to go to meeting information out of the way, in the help, if I go to from output, um, the from output 
gives you at least a little bit of information about the um, uh, as far as the where to get the information from. Um, but the important thing to note here is really all you have to do is create a a second uh, a second analysis within the same space, and then simply simply load the or the first thermal loading into the second analysis. And once that's been done, um, it will in turn use that information um, from it. Right? It's just a matter of what's the thermal output. Right? So when I go in here, edit this. We can see that that data. It's not showing the temperature. Um, it's because I've already ran the I already reran the second analysis, um, but that would in turn give me um, the data that I'm looking for. Sure. What's what's your question, Mitch? Um, so the the second ambient temperature that I put in was actually not a um, was not an ambient temperature. Um, if I go into my physical properties here for these materials, um, what this reference temperature is referring to, which in this case this one does not have it, um, but what this reference temperature is referring to is the um, these properties based at that temperature. So when you start to run thermal analyses, these values obviously are going to start to change as the the temperature increases within within the component. Um, and really what you're looking at there starts to get into the into the nonlinear space a little bit. Um, but thinking about you know the elasticity of material, um, obviously as you apply heat to it, that elasticity is going to be uh, dampened or lessened, right? Or uh, not, elasticity is increased, right? So that's essentially where that information is coming from. Um, what's the reference temperature of that component and you know how does it how does it function or how does it work within the space based at that temperature? Um, as far as why it doesn't have it in the CAN data, um, my immediate thought process on it is you know, well I don't know it. It probably could. Um, you know, the big thing there is you would have to um, you would have to have all three values defined. Uh, I think they're just assuming that you're going to define the temperature as you define the as you define the material. It's really just kind of part of the workflow. The biggest thing there is, you know, are you dealing with Kelvin, Celsius, or Fahrenheit, and how do those values adjust based on it? That's going to be more of the the user knowing those values going into the situation. And yeah, it is going to change. Excellent. So as was said, um, oh, go ahead. I'll let you. Well, I was just going to say um, thank you, Keith, for the presentation. And again, if you just have more questions, questions later you can email those to us and we will get them answered and other than that thanks for attending today's webcast and have a great day